Welcome to An Infinity of Worlds, Planets in Search for Life. And if you can see my slides, do proper view. All right, so there we go. We're gonna try to get through four weeks of a course in 50 minutes. Uh, so this is a quick outline about what we're gonna be doing in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, how do we find planets? What is the science behind planet detection? And how do we know what we know about the planets? that we see out there in the universe. And what else can we learn about them? What's the diversity of worlds? What is habitability? What makes a planet habitable? In inverted commas, you'll see there's a lot that goes into that. Um, life in the universe, what are we looking for? And would we know it if we saw it? And then of course, we gotta get to the aliens. So we're gonna be going pretty quickly because we wanna get to the aliens. That's why we're here, right? So uh, quick bits about me. Um, as you see, uh, I'm in my purple and I got my background of the college. Class of 98, we just did our 25 year, it was great fun. Majored in astronomy, biology, NVI, and crew, which if you're, if you're a rower, you know, that's like a major. Um, did a lot of winding road sorts of things as Williams people often do. Did some outdoor education, did teaching credential, a few times across the country, trying to figure myself out. Marine biology, Antarctica is in there somewhere. That's a whole other story. Then I got into San Diego State for astronomy and then off to PhD at Texas. After that, I went to Australia for my postdoc for three years and that was 15 years ago. So you know, Australia has been good to me. And now I'm very fortunate to have a professor position in Southern Queensland, which is going to be a bit west of Brisbane for those of you who know where uh, things are in Australia. Uh, also, a failed astronaut. Uh, I keep trying. I keep trying to be an astronaut. I apply every time. I keep trying. But, you know, can't win if you don't play. Uh, this is where I am now, which is Toowoomba, two hours west of Brisbane, 100 kilometers, 120 kilometers inland, near the big spiders and the carnivorous koala bears. That's basically where I am. Um, that's where the University of Southern Queensland is. That's where my observatory is. So let's get right into it. Um, some terminology you might see. Just a real quick start, astronomical unit, we like talking in AU. So the Earth is at one AU from the sun. That's a good de definition, especially if you're thinking about a planet that might be habitable. You want it to be around one AU. It's a good reference point. Light years, we've all heard about light years, but that's the distance light travels in a year. Um, you'll hear about that a lot as well. Parsec, you might see that, maybe not today, but that's what a parsec is. Astronomers like talking in parsecs. Uh, you do the Kessel run in 12 parsecs. That's what that means. It's the distance. Um, Kelvin's our temperature. I don't think we'll do that here much, but you know, if you're talking temperature of planets, you want your, your planet to be about 300 Kelvin, right? That's, that's Earth-like temperatures. So as a good rule of thumb, you might see that number. So let's get started with starting the universe first. To make planets, we have to make the universe. So to make the universe, you first start with a lot of hydrogen and you wait a long enough time, and that hydrogen turns into people, and those people start to wonder where it all came from. I've skipped over a fair bit of time here, but it's okay, because for a long time, nothing happened, and then we got planets. So let me show you this short video. Music. This is showing us a map of our galaxy and where all the planets are that we know about so far sound relates to the orbital period of the planet. How long does that planet take to go around the sun? Higher the pitch, shorter the period. see planets are basically everywhere in the galaxy that you look 
Um, there's one specific spot that you saw where there were lots of planets. I'll explain that in a moment. Um, here is another short video that shows the architectures of those systems. So what you see in the middle is our own solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars for scale. And they've overplotted all the other systems that we know about to scale. Seeing it, every one of these dots wibbly wobbling around, those are planets that we know about. Multiple systems, multiple planets orbiting one star. There's a system here, there's one over here. A bunch of these temperatures of the planets are here. Remember Kelvin? Earth is 300, so down here in the blue. Got a lot of lava worlds in the red. Got, they're all over the shop. What this is showing you is that most of the systems of planets that we know about look nothing like our solar system. Or our solar system at this scale. These are quite different from what our own solar system looks like. And they're all over the place. So what does that mean? So how do we do this? There's two main ways. There's, there's several other ways that are sort of less relevant and I don't have that expertise. Two main ways here. One is radial velocity where you actually measure the star itself wobbling due to a planet that orbits it. And the second one is transit, where the planet passes in front of the star by lucky geometry. And you can actually measure a little dimming. I'll go into those briefly here. The Google Doodle here is from a, a moment when seven planets were found around, around one star. And so it, it's quite cute. I always put it in there. So this is radio velocity in, in cartoon form, right? You know, you never see the planet. But you see the star. Stars are bright. So you go off and you measure the star, and you can actually measure the velocity of the star. And from that, you can tell that there's something pulling the star around. Another, another way of showing it is you take a spectrum of the star. So you actually take the light, big telescope, take the light, split it out into colors, disperse it out into colors, and the star has chemical fingerprints. Those are the black lines. Chemical fingerprints of the star will move. Each of these lines represents some element in the star's surface or atmosphere. And that line will move because the star itself is moving toward you or away from you. Think of the radar guns, you know, to you know get your speeding tickets. It's the same principle exactly, but with light, with with essentially visible light here. How do you do it? Well, this is another sort of wibbly wobbly cartoon that explains what you measure. Uh, and what we end up with is a plot like this. You measure the velocity of the star over time. It goes up and down with some regular motion. And if it repeats itself like that, that lets you know that's a planet. You think it's a planet. How do you do it? You need a spectrograph. What's a spectrograph? It is basically, uh, for those of us who are not really um, hardware people, it is a box that turns light into science. It, it literally goes into a box, actually several boxes to keep the temperature stable. So, uh, but the short version is light goes in here and you disperse it into multiple wavelengths, spread it way out uh, with all this glass and you put it on a detector and you end up with one of these. This is a spectrum. This is a spectrum of our own sun. And you see the chemical fingerprints from our own sun's atmosphere. Most of these lines are, most of these are iron or vanadium or things like this. There's sodium here, a couple of big hydrogen ones. So, um, but each line then will have a shift and you can measure the shift of each one of those lines and see if there's a planet. So shift happens, right? And fortunately you pick the right kind of star that has lots and lots of lines because each shift is very small. And so what you want to do is basically add up over thousands of lines because we're measuring something incredibly small. The result is a lot of dots, right? I tell people, all I do is really just connect dots with lines. I never really graduated kindergarten. This is what we do. We connect dots with lines, nice curvy lines. You observe your star, you measure a velocity, you go back and you do it again later, and you keep doing it until you build up this nice curve. And that's how you know this is a planet. In this case, this is a cartoon version of what's going on. It's, it's the hula hoop. Um, you might have, the sharp eye might have noticed, because I went so fast, P for period, orbital period. How long does this planet take to go around its star? Four days. Now, if we remember from third grade science, shortest planet in our solar system is Mercury, 88 days. 
suddenly this is looking at a thing that says four days and you're going, what is this? Um, not expected, you know, nobody expected that. The Spanish Inquisition and the hot Jupiters, two things no one expected. So when the first planets were found back in the 90s, back when I was running around here freshman year, um, hot Jupiters came out and people were like, what is this? This was not expected. So there's a good reason for this, why it was the first kind of planet found. I think you can probably drop in the chat why there might be a good reason for that. Um, I'm tempted to do some interactivity here. It's hard in this format, but uh, yeah, exactly. I'm seeing in the chat, they're big. Uh, and so it's, they're big. And also it's pretty easy gratification, right? If it's a four day orbit, you don't have to watch it for very long to finish the orbit. So, you know, they're big and they're easy to find. That's why they were the first to be found. Um, because the signal is so large. Uh, now, spoiler, um, hot Jupiters are not common. They're actually very rare, less than, it's about 1% of stars host these things, but they just happen to be the first found because they're so easy once you realize how to do it. Um, so the second method is the transit method, and that's a little more intuitively obvious because you could just measure the amount of light coming from your star. So we see eclipses, and transits here, you know, the obvious things being solar eclipses. Um, so in memoriam, Professor Jay Pasikoff, we went on solar eclipse expeditions for many years. The moon passes in front of the sun, you get an eclipse. Venus also passes in front of the sun, as you see in this video here. And you can measure the amount of light that is blocked when Venus cuts in front of the sun. So, sorry, you got to wait till 2117 for the next one, but the solar eclipse is in April. April 8th, be there. So transits we can do. Um, it requires a special geometry, right? The planet has to be you know, aligned edge on to you. But these were first found in 99, and it was another one of these hot Jupiters where you can measure a dip, about 1% dip, 1.5% dip in the light from your star. This was measurable, a little easier to do than, than the rate of velocity method once you get the hang of it. So this was proof that the things we saw from the radio velocity bunch were actually planet sized things, right? We had a mass, we didn't have a radius. We didn't know how big the thing was. Now we do. This tells you once you have a mass and a radius, you can work out its density, right? This first one actually was really puffy. This first one was 1.4 times the, the radius of Jupiter, but it actually didn't have as much mass as Jupiter. So you figure, okay, it's puffy. So transit method actually buys you a lot. And so we're going to be talking a lot about that. A lot of what we know about exoplanet detail in detail comes from the transits because you get so much information. And so you get the radius, of, of course. Um, and from the radius, you can get, if our radio velocity people, we can do it. You get a mass and a volume. Therefore, you get some estimate of its density. You know the old trope about how Saturn would float in a giant bucket of water because the density is less than that of water, same deal for these guys. We can work out the density of these planets. Here's where it matters. You wanna know what it's made of, right? If I'm after planets, I wanna know if I'm looking at a planet that is a big ball of hydrogen, like this puffy one over here, or if it's a tiny ball of iron, like this one on the left. So one Earth mass up here, five Earth masses. You measure a mass, this could really have any composition you want, depending on what elements are in it and its radius. And some of these are more habitable than others, right? Planets in search for life. You know, I would like to have a surface, please. Could I have that? Um, you're not going to have that if it's one of these guys on the right. Um, over here, silicate planets. That's kind of what we're after. The Earth is mostly silicates, some iron. We're after these sort of things, Earth analogs. That's why that matters. So this is a short, a, a small plot. Actually, it's a, a busy plot. But it's a, a nice summary of mass here on the bottom and radius on the left. And it shows you what is the relation between the mass and radius of the planet, it tells you what it's made of. So solar system, here's the Earth in, in orange here, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, Jupiter. What you notice is that the purple, purple, purple dots are all over the shop, right? A planet that has, uh, you know, five Earth masses over here, it could be anywhere from, you know, maybe one or two size one or two radii of the Earth, all the way up to 10. 
Some of these are super puffs. Some of these are of the density of cotton candy. These guys up here that are really, really puffy. They're cotton candy planets. Some down here are basically iron worlds. And so you see some of these notes here that tell you, you know, we know a lot about these planets and they're all over the shop, right? There's some really interesting stuff going on. Um, you know, hot watery Saturn, evaporating planets. That's a thing that's happening. Uh, escaping atmosphere, lava worlds. We got a lot of lava worlds. Um, all that kind of stuff. Some of these stars or planets are actually, we can tell how the color of it, pitch black. It's blacker than black. And we just know this by how much light reflects from it. So this is why transits are valuable um, because you can get all this information plus you can get the atmosphere. What is this kind of blue ring here? When the planet goes in front of the star, you want its atmosphere. Again, if I want a habitable planet, I would like to breathe. So if we want to find planets that might possibly be habitable, planets in search for life, atmosphere is a good thing, right? You don't want the restaurant on the moon that had no atmosphere. You, you want a real planet with something you can breathe. At this point, we got to do a crash course on stars. Um, time is limited, but I'll do my best. So stars come in sizes. Uh, you know, same way beer comes in pints, stars come in sizes. They come in different sizes and colors and temperatures. Our sun is over here. They call it a G-type star. This was our sun. Um, a lot of stars in the universe are actually much cooler and redder than our sun over here on the left, what they call M stars. And there are stars, of course, that are much larger and hotter than the sun. You can imagine that if you have a star of a different temperature, you need to put your planet in a different place so you can still be at the right temperature. So this is what they call the habitable zone. Um, so for the sun down here, the yellow G, sun's a G dwarf, habitable zone is basically about 1 AU, right? Good for us, right? We're on the earth, we're habitable. That's a good thing. Um, if you pick a cooler, smaller star, it's like a campfire, right? You have to get closer if your planet is habitable. So down here, there's little M dwarfs. You gotta be really close into the star. Also about these M dwarfs, which is why we harp on them, they're the most common things in the universe. Much more abundant, sort of relative abundance. For every one sun-like star, you might have 10 M dwarfs. So that's why people focus on them. They're actually the most common things around. So get back to Kepler. What is Kepler other than uh, obviously a, a scientist, Kepler's a spacecraft mission. So Kepler's job was to, it was the first mission that was actually trying to answer the question, how common are Earth-like planets or really Earth-sized planets in an orbit about one year around a sun-like star? So Kepler had this mission of looking at a, one patch of sky. You recognize this shape from that video, this shape is the patch of sky that Kepler was looking at back in, you know, when it was up in this, looking at the Kepler field. This field is in Northern Hemisphere near Cygnus. So that big blue patch where all the planets were, that's where it is. That's where Kepler was looking. If we are here at the sun, Kepler is kind of looking off in that direction in the galaxy. Most of the Kepler planets are about a couple of 3000 light years away. They're pretty far away. Um, here we are. Uh, thanks to Hitchhiker's Guide, we're way out in the middle of nowhere. But Kepler's looking at a very narrow area. And what Kepler taught us was that small planets are everywhere, right? So here on the left, you see what we knew about planets before the launch in 2008. This is what I knew in my PhD years about planets, because the radio velocity people, the pink ones, this is what we were doing. So we knew, okay, there were a bunch of Jupiters, bunch of hot Jupiters here in the blue. And we really didn't find much in the way of small stuff down here, right? Earth mass things. They're hard. They're really hard. Kepler went off and found the small planets transiting because it was a little easier to find them that way. And so Kepler dropped all the yellow ones. Boom. Surprise. All these planets between the size of Earth and Neptune, they're just, they're everywhere. They're like cockroaches. You see one, there's 10 others you miss because they're just everywhere. So you might also ask how many are in the habitable zone. That was the whole point of Kepler. So here's a plot that shows what Kepler found in the habitable zone of their star. So for reference, the Earth is here in this nice green area. Yes, that makes Mars technically a habitable zone planet. So, you know, there's a lot that goes into this 
habitable zone concept. So what you see here is all these have names, right? Kepler 62, 442, they just get numbers. Aside, people ask me all the time, do you get to name the planets that you discover? I'm sorry, you don't. They get numbers, they get letters because the stars already have the numbers. You know, like HD 209458, and you get B. Here we get Kepler 20, B, C, D, whatever. So unfortunately, big disappointment for everyone there. Um, but uh, I'm trying to keep up with the questions. Oh, why did they pick the Kepler field where it was? I think they wanted to go away from the galactic planes so that this, because then there's not too many stars. If the stars are too crowded close together on your image, then it's really hard to tell which star is actually showing the planet. And two, Northern Hemisphere, because NASA launched it, NASA paid for it. So they want Americans to use the telescopes in America to follow up and get more information on those planets. So that's why. I missed the Kepler revolution because as soon as it launched, I moved to Australia. Just and So I, I was literally on no Kepler discoveries at all. Broke my heart. Oh, well. That's why we have other missions. Um, so the Kepler revolution basically taught us what the statistics are. And we learned planets are everywhere. Small planets are ridiculously common. And in fact, pretty much there's more Earth-sized planets than stars. I'm trying to avoid the word Earth-like for a good reason. Earth size. That's all we got. We got the size. So Kepler's mission ended, as all mechanical things do, um, and it passed on the legacy to TESS. Now, I'm going to explain what TESS is. This is a cute little animation that NASA made. Um, this is a fun cinematic video of what is TESS. Since the dawn of time, mankind has sought an answer to an undying question. Are we alone? Now, humans possess the technology to solve this mystery, and we will shift their gaze to the stars. This is the search for exoplanets. This is TESS. So that's, I mean, the Goddard people put this together really, really fun and dramatic. So TESS is up right now and still dropping planet discoveries every month. So I'm working with TESS data at the moment. I have been for five years. Um, so it's awesome because it's whole sky. That means I can observe TESS planets too from Australia. Yay. Uh, and I've actually got on to like 33, 34 TESS planet discoveries. So you know. That can happen. But you might want to wonder, what do we expect, right? How do you make planets? We know how we find them. How do you make them? Well, people have ideas about this because we have our solar system. You look at our solar system and say, okay, what do we got? We got four big giant planets out there. and We got four small rocky planets on the inner part. And the orbits are pretty circular. It's all very orderly and kind of all in the same plane. It's all very, very nice, very orderly. And this led to quite some time ago, the Compton Laplace nebular models. Now, to first order, this is essentially this, the way modern planet formation understands it. There's some other details we don't need to get into, but this is basically how it works. Big clump of gas and dust collapses, forms a star in the center. There's a disk of material that spreads out and that ultimately coalesces into planets. So as far as we know, what we think now is that planets basically form this way in this nice orderly pattern. 
then things get interesting. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second. We expected this. We expected Jupiters, and we expected... Um, oops, already I've made an error in my... Uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, so, all right. My error has been recorded for posterity. So, we expected... Um, cold Jupiter. We expected regular Jupiter takes 10, 12 years to orbit, so people were just taking their time. We found these hot Jupiters and we're wondering, how did this happen? How did that get there? So the, the theorists had to work this out, and we've worked out, okay, planets migrate, and somehow they stop before they crash into the star. Sometimes they don't, but in this case, we only see the ones that, that stopped. Um, so the planets migrate, and what that meant was it's a lot more interesting universe than we thought. And one of the th consequences of that is you get some crazy eccentric planets, right? Our own solar system is nice and circular, very pretty, like the white circles you see on this plot here. We found a few planets that are just have these really elliptical orbits that you don't see. They're more like comets, but they're planets, All right? So this is, my, this is actually my favorite planet discovery here because it was such an eccentric orbit and it's orbiting a giant star. It's actually a doomed world. It's going to crash into the star eventually. Um, and this other one on the right is 20782, the most elliptical orbit that we know about. So eccentricity near one. So the higher this E number, the more crazy elliptical the orbit is. You can imagine that's not a good solar system to live in if you've got a planet that's crashing around like this, huh? So this matters. 80606 is a fun one because it transited, so you could actually uh, measure the, uh, the flash heating as it whipped around the star and goes out. You can actually measure the planet basically heating up. Um, how do you make an eccentric planet? You have, uh, you might form, uh, yeah, Phaethon's, yeah, hi, Alan. Uh, Phaethon's an asteroid. The plot was made by my friend, John T. Horner, who is like a solar system guy. He had to put Phaethon in there. Um, so uh, you find that you start with a nice orderly system of planets, and then you form too many planets. They interact with each other. Bad things happen. You kick out one, you get a feral planet. I'm trying to make feral planet happen. Um, and you get one that's left on this really weird orbit. So, uh, just a quick overview of some diversity before we get to the other stuff. Um, they're evaporating planets. You can name them. WASP-12 is one of them. There's more than one, but there's several. that we, You can actually see the atmosphere evaporating off like a comet's tail. Um, the diamond world, that's, that's sort of a good media thing. It just means it has a lot of carbon. So we call it a diamond world. Because what happens, you put a bunch of carbon in one place, you get a diamond. Um, so lava rains, you know, we've got ones with what they call silicate rains, where the planet is like a thousand degrees. And you know there's lots of winds because of the, the heat distribution, because it's the hot Jupiter and it's so close to the star. All the energy. Yeah. Lava rains. A few other lava worlds, not just Kuro 7, there's a bunch of them. Um, multiple stars. So three out of every two stars are binaries, as they as I was told in grad school. Um, so you can imagine planets orbiting two stars. Circumbinary planets are totally a thing. Kepler-47, Kepler-16, there's a few others. Um, Kepler-36, this is one where the two planets in the system are actually so close together in their orbit um, that if you stood on one, this is what you would see for scale when the other one went zipping by. It'd be that big in the sky. So this happens a lot too. Um, packed systems like that are actually pretty common. Kepler-11 is the famous one here. You could cram six planets inside the orbit of Venus. So all of them transited. That was fun. Here is Kepler-11 system. Again, put to music. Well, Kepler does these. It's called systemsound.org. Uh, where they do a lot of these and put them in Six planets. Another one. Oops. And they'll transit. So you see on the left, this is the transit that Kepler measured for each of those six planets. And of course, the transits have different lengths because the further out planet, like this one, is going to take longer to pass in front of itself. That's what that means. And they have a different depth, right? So here planet E is making a bigger, bigger shadow than 
say planet F. So you know that planet E is larger than planet F. Um, and the transits, let us learn about the atmospheres, right? Again, I would like to have atmosphere. This is important. So how do you do it? If you have a planet of transits, you have the light from the star passing through its atmosphere and it's being absorbed by ghosts and also your favorite elements and molecules like these, water, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, et cetera. Um, and you can actually measure this. So this is from the James Webb site where um, what would happen if you looked at the earth transiting in front of the sun? What would you see with a James Webb-like telescope? Say if aliens built one. Um, oh, our planet system is typically in the same plane. Yes and no. Um, sometimes no. We actually have misaligned planets where you get uh, two planets that are actually in different orbital planes. Now, how does that happen? There's probably some horrible dynamical uh, event that happened in the past that kicked one of them up into a different, different inclination. The universe is a dangerous place, right? So we're lucky this didn't happen in our solar system. So this, what you see here is a spectrum of the earth or what it would look like. And you would see various elements there or molecules, ozone, water, methane, cow farts are here. Carbon dioxide is us mostly. Um, ozone protects us from the UV. We need that. Um, molecular oxygen, we like that. I would like to breathe. So you might call some of these things biomarkers, indicators of life. Ozone is a particularly promising one because it makes such a big signal for how little of it is actually in the atmosphere. Um, so what does this get us to? What it gets us to is the future of telescopes and how we're going to find actually Earth-like planets. There's going to be something going up in a, a fair bit of time called Habitable Worlds Observatory. Habitable Worlds. Its goal is to take an image of a rocky planet in the habitable zone. How do you do that? Well, step one, find nearby stars. We know where they are. Step two, figure out which ones are going to be suitable. So part of our job on the working group for the next X years is to work out which stars are the best. And so Hab Worlds is going to look something like this. It's like a James Webb on steroids, essentially. It's going to be six to eight meters. I would like it larger. We'll see. Put it in space and you stare at your favorite stars. So, um, so it's called Habitable Worlds Observatory. That's a mouthful as an Aussie. Uh, you know, we shorten our words. Avo, Ambo, Servo, Arvo, you know, whatever. I'm calling it Habo. I have 20 years to make Habo happen. So this goes in every one of my talks. I'm making Habo happen. So what's Habo going to do? This is a simulated video from the Habo people. If you pointed it at a solar system like solar system, then this is what you would see. You've got basically a mask that blocks out the star because you don't want to look at the star, right? Stars are bright. You got all the planets, then you're able to image the planets. Once you block out the star, you can see the Earth, you can see Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Um, there's a lot of technical challenges here, but this is what we think HABO is going to do. And of course, the, getting the technology to work to block out the star this efficiently and still be able to see the Earth. That's the big challenge for the hardware people. Um, I'm not a hardware person, but smarter people than me can work that one out. Uh, let's see. I'll, I'll attack the questions later because I want to make sure we have enough time. Um, let's see. Onward from Habo. Hello. Yes, do not play the video. Keep going. There. Okay. There. Um, so you might ask, what is a habitable planet um, other than just being, you know, vaguely one AU from its star? I say drop your thoughts in the chat or the Q&A. Um, I guess the Q&A. Either or. I'm looking at both at the moment. And there's lots of interesting questions. This is good. Um, so what are some things, some characteristics that... Okay. Wow, lots of fun questions over here. All right, I don't want to get bogged down in the questions, but okay. So to make a planet habitable, what are some characteristics you might want to have? We've got reasonable temperatures. So that's um, 
you know, that whole habitable zone kind of want to be around one AU. Also, you would like your orbit to be vaguely circular, so you're not kind of whipping in and getting roasted and then freezing. Um, oxygen is good. We like oxygen. We'd like an atmosphere. Um, we'd like a magnetic field to keep the atmosphere in place so that the solar radiation, solar wind doesn't blast it away. Um, we would love all those things. Water. Um, good news is water is super common in the universe. So it seems that water is everywhere. There's actually water worlds. There's planets that we know about that, that probably have like an entire Earth mass of water um, because water is so common. So you'd like water. You'd like land. So you don't want too much water? I don't know. Could If you have a planet that's all a water world, could they develop technology? If you don't have any land, can you invent fire? Huh. So all this stuff comes into when you're thinking about habitable planets and intelligent life, right? Aliens. There could be lots of planets full of intelligent lobsters, but we would never find them. I don't know, unless they got smart enough to build spaceships. Um, so this gets us into the Drake equation, which is more about aliens, right? We came here for aliens and we're doing aliens. Okay, we're doing it. So what's the Drake equation? It's Frank Drake was one of the first people to sort of pioneer this concept of looking for intelligent life in a serious scientific way. Um, so Drake equation is more of a thought experiment. It, it, how many communicating civilizations are out there? And so you see all these factors that go in and they kind of go from the, the more measurable to the more speculative. You know, things like the rate of star formation, number of stars, we can work that one out. That's that's easy to measure. For action of stars with planets, we can measure that. Number of planets with, with an environment suitable for life in the habitable zone, we can measure that. We, we're getting good at that. Then it gets a little more, okay. One number of planets that life actually appears on. And then if you have a life-bearing planet, if that life actually gets smart, and what does smart mean, right? And then FC, civilization C for communication, invents radio telescopes or some other means of advertising their presence. And finally L, right? The big L, which here is how long do they last and whilst they're communicating. And a lot can go into that L, as you might guess. Um, so uh, it's really more of a way of quantifying your ignorance. It's, a, it's sort of a thought experiment. Um, so I, I sometimes put an e equation in sarcasm quotes because it's more of a thought experiment to think about you know, what, do, what might be out there, right? Um, so you know, some of these terms, we've, we've done a good job of measuring them. This is what Kepler was built to do. And so... You know, fraction of stars with planets is probably about 100%. There's like cockroaches, right? That every star has planets. Um, real question is, how many planets per star might support life? For our solar system, depending on who you ask, it could be three, right? If you, what they call the optimistic habitable zone, Venus, early Venus is a candidate. Uh, early Mars, before it lost the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, why are we sending all these probes there? You know, there's a lot of uncertainty that goes into that number. This is a plot that shows how uncertain the number is at the moment. You know, it ranges from about 0.1 to almost two planets per star in terms of habitable zone planets. And the reason there's so much uncertainty is because Kepler, one, we're going off of what Kepler found, and they didn't find a whole heck of a lot. And so there's a lot of room for, for uncertainty there. And of course, you might also think there's probably room for uncertainty in terms of well, okay, yeah, Mars is technically habitable, but is it really? Who do you want to know? Who do you who do you, who do you ask? Right? Um, yes, the Martians—they're not there anymore. So, um, another reason for uncertainty is your definition of habitability. So, you know, think about icy moons, Europa, Enceladus. You got a moon that's got a layer of ice and a whole bunch of ocean, hundred kilometers of ocean underneath. Liquid water is everywhere. Could something be living there? Maybe. Would you ever detect it? Eh, that's a whole other thing. Um, oxygen. Yes, we need oxygen, but oxygen is actually a recent occurrence in the Earth history. There was plenty of life on Earth before oxygen rocked up. So, you know, what do you call habitable? Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty here. Drake equation. Uh, at this point, we go to speculative, right? In favor of making this number larger is that life seems to have turned up pretty quick once you stopped uh, whacking us with asteroids and you know leveling the surface. Bacterial life seems to have turned up pretty quick. 
Um, so how many of those life bearing planets that are full of bacteria actually develop intelligence and you know bang rocks together and stuff? It depends who you ask, right? We read a book in this class called Rare Earth that really goes into an argument that Earth is rare, it's right? It's in the name. Um, so the argument there is complex life is very hard to make and keep. And so maybe the number is really tiny, 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus nine. What's intelligence? That's a whole other thing, right? Can you make tools? Can you invent radio telescopes? You know, detectable by us, right? Again, you have a whole planet full of smart lobsters. Would we detect them? I don't know. So um, intentional versus unintentional communication, that gets into, you know, do you have radio and TV beaming out into space, just leaking out uh, versus that's unintentional communication versus the classic idea of taking a radio telescope and beaming an intentional signal somewhere. Two different things. Um, uh, lifetime. Here's the, the, the big one, right? What determines the lifetime? The obvious thing is, do we blow ourselves up? Do we, um, you know, kill ourselves in some horrible way? That's, that's sort of the, the depressing bits, but also less depressing. Um, what if you're only leaking signals to space for a short time before you invent, uh, you know, tight beam transmissions, or, you know, you're no longer watching free to air TV, you're streaming. What determines this number? You know, is it a hundred years? Is it a billion years? Don't know. What's a great filter? I have to go really fast now, but we can do this. Great filter is this concept. It's a hypothesis that either, you know, there's some, there's some really difficult step, which is why we don't see any other aliens. We are first, right? You can imagine we're this red line here. We're first. Option two, we are rare. And maybe the other species that's passed some great filter is too far away to be seen. I don't know, the galaxy. Option three, of course, is there is no great filter. The whole thing is just a, a not, not a correct hypothesis. Or number four, we're stuffed, meaning, you know, there's a great filter and it's ahead of us. And that is going to spell our doom. Maybe all civilizations that are smart enough to develop technology uh, kill themselves eventually through some means. You can think of any number of means, you know, the world's depressing enough. You can think a lot of ways. Um, Kardashev scale. This is a fun concept uh, in terms of thinking about alien civilizations and how much energy they use. So we're the Earth. We're, probably, we're not even type one. We're like type 0 0.7. We haven't made it to one yet. You can think of a K2 civilization as basically collecting the energy of its whole star, right? Dyson spheres being the classic example. Um, for science fiction. And a K3 would use the energy of a whole galaxy. We don't even know what that looks like. And again, this is where you get into real fun speculation and it's essentially indistinguishable from magic at that point. That's what a famous Arthur C. Clarke quote. Um, so, but the Dyson Sphere, the halo from the video game, yeah, that's totally a K2 civilization. Um, and I suggest some books here. So, but where are they, right? If the universe is full of aliens and technology is inevitable, where are they? It's not that hard, right? Even if you don't have to have warp drive, let's say on this plot, you're going, you take 500 years to send a ship to another planet, to the next star system. And you do that again and again, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 years. You can cover the whole galaxy in like 5 million years. Now, 5 million years is not much time, okay? Sorry, astronomers speak here. 500 million years, blink of the eye, right? Less than a 2,000th the age of the galaxy. So somebody must have done this. Where are they? Where are the aliens? That was the Fermi paradox. Where are they? So um, you can imagine a lot of possible solutions. Thoughts about why we don't see any evidence of aliens yet. You know, we're alone or we're not. They're both terrifying, um, depending how you think about it. So, you know, maybe they were here and they left monoliths or artifacts or not. Uh, they exist but we haven't seen or hear from them for a variety of reasons, it's a whole lot of reasons, or they're just not, and maybe we literally are alone. There's a few other thoughts here. Um, feel free to drop them in the Q&A and I'll try to get to them um, at the end. Oh, we're running a little on time. Um, so for the interest of reader, this book, which we don't assign in the class because it's expensive and it's, it's quite long, but I ask the students to come up with reasons why we haven't seen evidence of aliens and they've not read this book. So it's like, okay, how many of the 75 in this book does the class come up with on their own? It's a really fun exercise. And there's all kinds of interesting things. Um, 
you immediately start thinking about sinister solutions, right? You know, we've seen all the movies about alien invasions, right? Why would aliens come visit us? Well, dark forest hypothesis is the thought that maybe we don't hear from aliens because they're hiding. Because other civilizations see every other civilization as a threat, and so you want to hide. Dark Forest Hypothesis relates to, it's actually the title of the second book in this series, Three Body Problem. Recommended series, good good series. Um, we also know from our own history that contact between civilizations at different levels of technology is not a good thing. Uh, it, it does not go well. Uh, I always do this because we're doing this class you know, around Australia Day, which is a very controversial thing. We call it Invasion Day. Um, it just highlights that this is something that is a thing. And maybe this is why we haven't heard from aliens because they're hiding or maybe we should be afraid of the aliens. Uh, here's a few scenarios just running through real quick. Prime Directive, if you're a Star Trek fan, I love Star Trek. So, you know, maybe it's non-interference. Zoo hypothesis. Are we in a zoo just being observed? Um, missing the signal, right? What if they're transmitting in a, in a signal type of thing that we can't see? Gravitational waves. We're, we're very bad at measuring them. We can do it. But, you know, it's, it's hard. Um, what if we've got a bias here? What if we say, oh, everyone wants to colonize the galaxy? Maybe they don't. You know, what if they've all um, gone Netflix and chill, right? They're not broadcasting, they're streaming. So we're not seeing their TV and radio. What if uh, berserkers, uh, if there's a civilization that's gone out and built machines that destroy other civilizations? That's why everyone's gone. Berserkers. Um, it's just a fun word. Um, yeah. What if they use their resources before they get off their planet? That's That seems a distinct possibility here, actually. Um, but in general, what if the L term, I had to put this in, I'm sorry, but I'm going to do it, where if civilization is ephemeral, life times are too short. Maybe if civilizations that are intelligent and communicating only last a few hundred years, think four dimensionally, right? We miss them and they'll miss us. So there's a lot going on here. And... Um, it's again, uh, yeah, really out of time. So I think that's the end of it. Oh, obviously, yes. Um, you know, how to cook humans. We got to do that to serve man. Um, this is the final slide. I'm going to leave the book club recommendation up. And now I can try to tackle some of the questions. There are a lot, which is great. Um, make sure I don't hide the screen there. Okay. So, well. The last in, first out. Um, all right. So how far have Earth's radio communications traveled? Um, the answer to that is, well, if you saw the film Contact, and we do watch that in the class, um, the first real broadcast were around World War II um, in about the 40s. So 80 years, that means 80, there's like an 80 light year wide bubble of radio leakage and TV leakage that's gone out. Now, for comparison, what's 80 light years? The galaxy is about 30,000 light years across. So we've explored a very, very tiny, very tiny part of the galaxy knows we're here, essentially. So um, let's see. Da, da, da. A question about um, moons like Europa. Where are the people are looking for exomoons is a bit of a debate in our community. Uh, they must exist, right? But it's just, it's very hard to find them. And so nobody's found a convincing exomoon example. But yeah, icy, icy worlds like Europa, Enceladus, those are prime candidates in our own solar system. Definitely some good ideas going there. Um, let's see. Um, a lot of questions. Prime zone are finding water and breathable oxygen. Well, you want the equilibrium, the temperature of the planet to be about, you know, Earth-like temperature of 300. Ah, oh, yes, Roger Hail Mary. That's on my website. But yeah, that's, that's totally a good call. Thanks, Alan. Hi, Alan. Um, ah, yes. Habitable for whom? That's the other thing. Habitable zone. What does that mean? It's a very sort of human centric idea of habitable. You know, if you're a nice, if you're a bacterium that doesn't need oxygen and eats rocks and hangs out underground, you don't care about an atmosphere even. All you need is some rocks to eat. And these things exist. We know about them. There's bacteria living kilometers under the Earth's surface that don't even know the sun exists because they don't need it. It's, so there's a whole fascinating world of extreme environment or with a, uh, extreme environment life out there. Um, okay. Um, let's see. 
Yeah, well, I don't want to give a wrong answer about where they're going to put have worlds, but I'm guessing they'll put it around, yeah, L1, L2, out where um, where web is, just so you can get away from the earth. I'll try. Uh, uh, okay. Two windows going on. Okay. Yes, why do scientists assume life elsewhere is similar to life on earth? Um, it does limit the type of planets you're looking for if you're interested in habitable planets. I think the answer to that one is um, we've got nothing else to go on, so you might as well start with what you know. Um, I, that, that's that's not a super satisfying answer, but I think that's why we're doing it. Um, is sort of like the old joke of, oh, I lost my contact lens, so I'm looking under the street lamp. Well, where'd you lose it? Over there. Well, but the light's over here. So you, you look... You basically look for what you know. Um, I think that's that's the short version of, of that one. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's a few questions of why we're doing Earth-like planets, but that's sort of the reason. Okay. Expected resolution that Cabo will provide. Um, we do identify close in planets to any height of a star when light goes. Okay. I think, okay, so the question about the resolution of the Hab Worlds Observatory. Um, well, it hasn't been designed yet. Part of all the working groups are, are working on this right now and for the next X years to really get the design specs, right? We don't even have that. We don't know how big the thing's going to be. Um, so the expected resolution what in terms of like for an imaging mission, what that means is you mask out your star and how far from, how close to the star could you resolve a planet before it's under the mask? And so I, ideally, of course, you would want an Earth-like planet in an Earth-like orbit. That's really the zeroth order thing we're looking for. So if you're looking for a planet that's going to be one AU from its star, and you need your star to be close because as the star is further away, of course, everything gets close. And you know how objects further away appear smaller. That means one AU of distance from the star is going to be a lot smaller if you put your star further away. And so a huge constraint for HABO is you have to pick stars that are close to us. That's why the list is so small. It's 164 stars. You're really constrained by how close the stars are. And the universe didn't build that many stars close to us. So that's a huge limitation. But I, without knowledge, uh, I would guess that they want to build the mask and the technology such that you can observe a planet within one A or at one AU from its star where the star is within 10 parsecs, which is to say about 30-ish light years. Um, Ah, Alan asks, to what extent can we rule out K2 or K3 civilizations in our local universe? There's some fun papers by Jason Wright, and, and you know Jason, um, and the, the Penn State bunch that have done exactly this. People have done this. They've totally looked for Dyson spheres because you're looking for something that is basically radiating more infrared light than you think it ought to. That's not a star. And you can do this with some of the far infrared surface, like two mass and such. Um, and they've used the two mass data and looked basically for anomalous red things and found no Dyson spheres in our galaxy. I guess we, we would have heard about it. Um, so we can certainly rule out K2 civilizations in our own galaxy and you rule out K3 civilizations out to some, it's in the papers, but some great distance you can rule out K3 civilizations within many tens of millions of light years. Um, so people have done this. It is actually a thing. Um, all right. Uh, ah, what happens to a planet that's kicked out of a solar system? Well, if it's thrown out, then it gets, basically becomes a free-floating planet. Now, we know those exist. Uh, you can observe young planetary forming regions like in Orion Nebula, where the planets are bright enough, they're still visible, you know, with direct imaging, and you see things that do not orbit a star and they're just kind of zipping along. Um, so we know they exist. So they just get kicked out and they become rogue planets or free floating planets. I still want to make feral planet happen, but that's it. That's how you know they're there. Um, let's see. Um, is exobiology a real thing? Absolutely. Astrobiology is totally a thing. Um, there are PhD programs in astrobiology. They didn't exist when I was doing it. Um, back in 2001, there was only one at University of Washington, but now they're there was totally a whole NASA Astrobiology Institute. There's a class here taught on astrobiology. Uh, Professor Phoebe Cohen teaches a class 
with that title. Um, and she's in geoscience. She's going to give a little guest talk in my class tomorrow. So yeah, it's, it's a legit thing now. Uh, let's see. Are we interested in finding alien life or planets we can colonize? Well, um, the former. We're more interested in finding evidence of life and how common life is in the universe. Obviously, everyone wants to know, is there a planet that we can escape to? And it's a fun concept. Uh, but in practice, space is big. And so even if you found Proxima Centauri, four light years away, near a star, it's got three planets. One's in the habitable zone. Um, but getting four light years away is very hard. We don't really know how to do it. Um, it would be a monumental, we can't even get to Mars, right? So colonizing other planets and other star systems is so far the realm of science fiction. It's fun to think about. I love it. That's why I suggest all these books. And the scientists are really concentrating on more what's out there, how common is life in the universe. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I got three minutes. Okay. Um, okay. Hmm. Well, that's been interesting. I served for four years in this, in this. The leader stated firmly, the value of human space exploration is preservation of the human race. Your thoughts. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ted. So my thoughts, um, uh, why do we do human space exploration, especially given that we can't up and colonize another planet? Even going to Mars is so hard. And I think my thoughts are, uh, I'm still very much of that mindset that we should get our eggs out of the Earth basket and go to another planet and set up shop somewhere else because it doesn't take much to take us out, right? I didn't get into dangerous universe, but it's a dangerous universe. The obvious things, apart from self-inflicted disasters, which we all know about from just reading the news, asteroid impacts are obviously a thing. If you see the film, don't look up. That's sort of comically depressing What how might we might react to that kind of thing. So um, yeah, it's... The, Let's see. The dinosaurs went extinct because they did not have a space program. Oh, think about that one. So um, definitely I'm in agreement with, with that concept. Um, I think I'm at the end of time. Getting the learn more link. Um, let's see. Oh, how might AI help the search? AI is totally doing this. You know, all those transit satellites that have millions of stars. They're totally sending AI and machine learning after these light curves. You have 20 million light curves with data from all these stars. Machines are good at this. And so you train it up on what does a transit look like and let it loose on 20 million test light curves. Yeah, AI is totally finding planets. Not a lot right now, but it's getting better and better. And there's totally a whole field of people doing this. Um, let's see. All right. went so fast, but I think we're almost out of time, but I'll keep asking questions until they basically throw me out. Um, let's see. Open. Can I tackle all three open questions? They're hard questions. Um, can I make my slides downloadable so we can peruse them later? Uh, I guess I can do. Um, a lot of this is on the course website, which is not in Glow. It's actually on a third-party site, so it's open to the whole world which the alumni people just dropped in the chat. So that's a good first step. And I think I have links to some of the some of the class sessions in there. Have a look there. Um, okay. And Kevin's asking about, uh, yeah, atmospheres, biosignatures. There's dirty secret. Um, we still don't really agree on what a biosignature is, right? Because there's all sorts of non-biological ways to make a lot of these, these gases. So there's still argument. There's not one slam dunk. Biosignature. Um, let's see. Oh, there's still more questions over here. Uh, the TMTs. Uh, okay. Yay. People appreciate it. Um, so, yeah. So, Kevin's asking um, you only get a probability of extra life. How will we as a society decide that we are or are not alone? Yeah, because there's always going to be a, a subset of people who don't believe it, right? especially now with disinformation being what it is. Um, if James Webb announced tomorrow that they found signs of life on or biosignatures on some planet, at what point would it be a concrete, you know, yes, we are definitely not alone. 
I don't know. And unfortunately, it's a very hard question, especially when I have negative two minutes. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay. Huh. Why do we assume that life like humans would develop when we are only here because at least two major extinctions? That's another really good question. What if it's all dinosaurs? What if the dinosaurs on other planets developed a space program? There was a Star Trek episode about that. It's called Distant Origin, Star Trek Voyager. Check it out. Hypothesis is the dinosaurs escaped before they got wiped out and they moved to another planet. You know, it's a subject of speculation. So again, I think people assume that because we have nothing else to go on, right? It's um you might as well start with what you know okay maybe one last question to bring us home okay um, well, there's one last question here which is a hard question but um this hard question uh is is there must research much research on other types of life or consciousness in the universe that is different from our one data point of life on earth um and that's an exceptionally hard question which is why i was avoiding it the whole time um so uh, the answer to that is that I have no idea. There's got to be somebody doing it, but it's so, it's so wild. I imagine the biologists are doing this. You might imagine like non-carbon based life. Somebody must be doing that in the biology, biochemistry or biochemistry that does not require water as a solvent. Could you have say liquid sulfuric acid as a solvent? Think Venus. Somebody must be doing this. I can't name names. I don't know, but I bet people are. And that's the area that people are probably doing it, is looking at types of life that are so wildly different from what we understand here. Go Eves. Thank you, Leela and everybody else. Um, I think the recording stopped. And I think everyone's done, but hope I got all the questions. So... Thanks everyone. Um, I will see you all well past time. Okay, escape.